Well, I've warned you the answers may not be up to much, but we take the question. Adrian, speak up on death. All right, well, this is a half a question. Okay. That, but um, it seemed to me, when I was studying the book of Galatians, yes. the real problem isn't legalism as such. That seems too obvious to a, a Christian who's been down the road for some time. But the problems that ex was explained in Galatians is the real problem for Christians, where we accept the fact that we're not saved by works, but plus works. You know, we're saved by Jesus Christ, plus works. Well, we are and we are not, if you understand what I mean. Well, can I remind you of what I said earlier? We're not saved by faith plus works, but by a faith that works. That works. Yeah. We're saved by faith alone, but the faith that saves is never alone. Once you fall in love with Christ... You want to do what he wants. Yeah. That's your joy. Yeah. So that that's really what I gained from it. Okay. It took Good me for ages you. to work it out. Any other question? Well, I just want to say something about this verse 18 of Romans 5, 18, because verse 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19 all say the same thing. So when I read this for the first time, this had the most, as a new Christian, this had the most profound effect on me because every of those five verses said the same thing. Through one man came, the, uh, 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 the fall came through one man and all men were lost through one man and through one man all men were saved. So now as a young Christian, I said to myself, well then who is lost? Because I know that salvation is a free gift and I know that a gift does not have to be accepted. To get a gift, you don't have to accept it. I mean, I can pay your mortgage and you don't have to accept it. You wake up tomorrow morning, your mortgage is paid and you can, what do you do? Reject it? Keep paying your mortgage? So I knew that. So that's created a huge amount of confusion in my mind. I said, but who is lost? If, if all men are saved, who then is lost? Well, look at Matthew 23. How often would I have gathered you as a hen gathers her chickens? But what's next? But ye would not. So you reject it. John 3.36 He that believeth has everlasting life. But the next part says he that doesn't believe doesn't have everlasting life. So it's life. rejection. So your point about acceptance is the main point. Will I extend the naked hand of a beggar in humility? It <clears> takes humility to be saved. Pride is the source of every other sin. But in conversion, I see that unless I have Christ's love and goodness, I am nothing. So that's recognizing nothingness, I come and take the gift. That's the problem. God does not hold his hand out to us. He, Like the Father, he grabs us. So how can you be lost if somebody grabs you like the Son? It can only be a rejection, only if the Son pushes him away, because God does not. Well, many people do. Yes. See, you can't read Luke, uh, Matthew 23 and miss the last verses. How often would I, but ye would not. And there are several places. <clears throat> the most well-known verse of the Bible, God's love of the world. That's a big circle. That whosoever believe it, that's a smaller circle. Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God does nothing without our response, except his prevenient grace in calling us. Mm. That's his initiative. I never turn to God on my own. But after that, he's not going to force me. He wants a love that's genuine and free. Mm. Any other question? Des. Go ahead. Oh, I thought there was a lady there first, sorry. Oh. Uh, years ago, I, I asked you a question. I said, do, do you ever have any doubts about this whole thing? And you gave me a wonderful review. You said, Peter, the only thing I can tell you is get to know Jesus. And yet, and it, this goes back to what you said earlier at, at the beginning of your talk, how we all fail. I still feel after all these years of trying to get to know Jesus that I still don't really know him. I don't have that love for him I'd like to have. Are there any extra clues you can give? Peter, you are saved by his love for you accepted not by the amount of your love for him, because all of us only have a little shell full. So I'll say it again. We are saved by his love for us. 
if we'll accept it. Not by our love for him, which is always a bit threadbare, shoddy. You don't look within to be comfortable as a Christian. You look up. Luther had it right. He said, when I look at myself, I don't see how I could ever be saved. But when I look to Christ, I don't see how I could ever be lost. <coughs> That's the heart of it. Don't look at yourself, Peter. None of us have anything much there. Look to him. Someone else had a question. Viliana, was it you? Yeah, I was just continuing on with this whole idea, and it's probably more that I don't seem to be able to answer satisfactorily those who, reading the same scripture, uh, you know, would say, as in Adam all die, so in Christ are all made alive. Uh, you know, whether this is many or all. But also the whole notion that throughout history, you know, there are races, tribes, nationalities who have never had had a chance, you know, to hear of Jesus. Luke 12 says, to whom much is given, much is expected. To whom little is given, little is expected. The Holy Spirit at work in all the world, where the gospel is not known. So is the blood applied to those who have never accepted Jesus because they have never heard? Or are they going to have a chance of salvation purely by the fact that the Holy Spirit worked in their hearts I and they think, responded? I think if they do, that's by works then. Miliana, so. there are several things. Most people have some sort of a conscience. Romans 2 talks about the Gentiles that have not the law, but nevertheless do many right things because of conscience. That's the first thing. Second, nature as interpreted to us by the Holy Spirit. Not nature on its own. Cruel, vindictive, dangerous, but interpreted by the Holy Spirit. Plenty of air, sunshine, food, beautiful flowers. Secondly, nature. But the culminating point is always the moving of the Spirit, bringing us nearer and nearer to the right. None of us are going to get all things right. We will all make many mistakes, as James says. But we're accepted in the Beloved. We're complete in Him. I don't have to look at my failures. I regret them. I confess them. I move on. My faith is in Jesus. Luke 12. To whom much is given, much is expected. To whom little is given. Acts 10. In every nation, God has people. It says so. But, but Des, I really want to be very specific because I, I fully understand you know, what you're saying. But when it comes to, Jesus said, I am the truth, I am the way, I am the gate. Nobody comes to the Father but through me. But these people Thank have goodness. never <laughs> heard of Jesus at well, all. Yana, you mustn't separate the members of the Trinity has seen and known God is three, has seen and knowing God is one. Where the Holy Spirit is, there is Christ. Where Christ is, there is the Holy Spirit. God loves more than you do, more than I do. God suffers when people reject him. The shepherd didn't sit at home when the sheep was lost. He goes looking for them. Only one lost, one world lost. The 99 trillion worlds are not lost. But he came for the one world that was lost. He didn't stay still. The woman doesn't stay still. She grabs a broom. She lights a candle, symbol of the word of God. And she sweeps, makes a mess, makes chaos. There's always trouble when you want to apply the gospel. You can't apply the gospel without getting into trouble. But God suffers because the son is away. The woman suffers because she's lost the coin. The shepherd suffers because the one sheep is missing. So once we're convinced of the love of God, we don't have to know all the answers, will you, Anna? We have to let God know more than we do and trust him. So are you saying, it's Gail, are you saying then that the Holy Spirit works on these people who yes, have understood. Yes, that's who right. Have never known about God. Yes, 65% of the people who've ever lived, there are 10 billion people who've lived, 
65% have never had this book. Yes, right, okay. It may help if you remember what Paul says in one verse in 1 Corinthians where he talks about we're made a theatre to the cosmos. When God talks about the nations of the world, he says they're a small dust of a balance, just a sprinkling. So God's concern is not just with this little flock here, at the moment is about 8 billion. God has something in mind for the whole universe. Never will sin be repeated again. But its awful results must be permitted to show itself before God rings down the curtain. I think if we keep in mind that the whole show is bigger than just this planet, it may help us a little. But we never will understand all the questions we have. Even in the kingdom, will be eternity learning. Another question. Right. We're going on to our last talk. Passion Week is a picture of the end of the world. All that happened to Jesus in Passion Week is typical of what will happen on a global scale at the end of the world. And I'm not going to talk about that now. I've written books on it. But in Passion Week entrance, he's seen as king. Zechariah, thy king cometh lowly and having salvation, riding on the foal of an ass. He's seen as king, triumphal entry. When he cleanses the temple, after getting into the city, we see him as priest. When he gives a sermon in Matthew 24 and 25, we see him as prophet. So king, priest, prophet. Now, two days before his death, he decides to have a climax with the Pharisees. He will give them a last chance to accept him. John the Baptist has said, this is the Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. John the Baptist, whom the tax gatherers accepted and the prostitutes accepted. And even the Pharisees were told there was a door open for them if they would come. But Christ is going to give another last chance to the to the scribes and Pharisees. If not, he'll excommunicate them. So we're going to read that story. And I'm going to turn to you from Luke 21. This is a story of the vineyard and it has much of blessing for you and me today. Here we are. He's talking to the Pharisees. They've demanded of him, what's your authority? And he thinks to himself, if after I've raised the dead and given sight to the blind and made cripples to walk, doesn't matter what I say about my authority, it's not going to help them. So instead he tells stories. He tells the story of two sons. One says, I'll go and work. He doesn't go. The other one says, I won't go. He repents and goes. The second man represents a tax gatherer. first man, the Pharisees. They think they're doing, but they never do. See, but here's the second story. Parable of the Tenants. I'm reading from uh, 33 of 21, chapter 21. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. So here's a picture of Jesus and Israel. Isaiah 5 has the same imagery as this chapter. God selected Israel to be his teachers of the world. They failed him. He replaced Israel with the new Israel, the Christian church, which is also failing him. But maybe he has a different motive than what we think. Maybe his main purpose is not so much quantitative gathering as qualitative significance of the cross. Who knows? Anyway, this is a picture of Israel and God. He went away on a journey. Christ has come and soon is leaving. The harvest time approached. He sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. 
for 1500 years he'd been sending the prophets who called on Israel to bring forth such fruit that the Gentile nations would see and respond. That's God's ideal plan. The ideal and the real aren't always the same because he leaves us free. That's why there's so much evil in the world. He could cut down the evil if he took out our freedom. But he thinks freedom's so important. There are terrible things happening this very hour. And they will increase. Matthew 24 says the whole world will become a polluting carcass before the second advent. Where the carcass is, the vultures will be gathered together. The whole world's going to become like a polluted carcass. We don't know what's going to happen in the atomic realm. Ross lent me an article on it that I found fascinating. But the main point was there's no way of preventing nuclear war. That's the main point. When we talk about warfare, we're used to talking about winning wars. Now in the world, the objective is to prevent war. There's no way of really winning a nuclear war. Here are these subs. All parts of the globe with nuclear weapons a thousand times more powerful than what destroyed Hiroshima. So even if we wipe out a country like North Korea, their sub knows and sends a response on New York and Washington and so on. So the world's going to get worse. Christ said the love of the many, that's what the Greek says, will wax cold. He's talking about Christians. He's saying that most people in the church will give up on it because the world's going to be tough. He also says unless we take up the cross and follow him, we can't really be Christians. It's very cheap to become a Christian. It's not cheap to remain one. It can be if we keep looking to Jesus. But there are so many things that threaten to distract us. Well, he sent the prophets for the fruit. The fruit is the fruit of the Spirit to win the Gentiles. They don't give it. Then it finally he says he sent other servants and they were treated with contempt. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They respect my son, he said. Here's the patient love of God. For 15 centuries he sent prophets trying to get Israel to bring forth fruit. It hasn't worked. They're about to kill him. I'll send my son. He knows what it will cost. It'll cost him his son. But he hopefully says, I respect my son. That's human language. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, this is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Very interesting, threw him out of the vineyard. Hebrews says Christ died outside the gate. In the Day of Atonement, sacrifices, special sacrifice, were slain outside the gate. Christ perished outside the gate of Jerusalem. Here the heir is thrown out of the vineyard. He's outside the gate. He's rejected by his own people. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to these tenants? And although they're beginning to suspect the parables against them, they give him the right answer. He will miserably destroy those wretched people and he'll rent the vineyard to others who give him his share of the crop. And Jesus said, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the headstone of the corner. And whoever falls on that stone will be injured. But on whoever it falls will be crushed to powder. Quoting Daniel 2, 43 to 45, the stone hitting the image on the feet. So Christ is now preparing to excommunicate Israel. He said, remember when they were building the temple? They couldn't find a headstone, a capstone. There was a big ugly stone in the corner, but they didn't like that. 
but at last they had no alternative and they pick up this despised stone and it fits perfectly so in Psalm 118 the stone the builders rejected the air and the stone are the same Christ will become the headstone of the corner here's a great prophecy Christ is to be the chief source of truth in all the world the headstone of the world he is that I have books upstairs on all the religions of the world. There's nothing like Christianity. There's nothing quite so clear about the resurrection of the dead. There's nothing so wonderful as a cross of Calvary. There's nothing like the invitation, whosoever will may come, which is found so often in Scripture. So he warns them. He tells them. The builders rejected the stone when they made the temple. You are rejecting the headstone of the temple God wants next to erect but they won't hear it then it goes on to say therefore I tell you the kingdom of God will be taken away from you given to a people who produce its fruit there's the excommunication of Israel the kingdom of God is taken from you now there will be Jews saved, there will be more Jews become Christians last 16, 17 years than the previous centuries. God loves the Jews as much as he loves any other nation. <coughs> but he will not take away freedom. You and I face this fact of freedom every day in our eating, in our drinking, in our spending, in our loving, in our going, in our staying. We're all, in a sense, blessed and haunted by freedom. But here is the excommunication of the nation. He still loves every individual Jew. But the nation can no longer be what he intended. Now please look at the next chapter. Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet. I love the way the Bible's got lots of feasts. As a small boy that always appeals to me very much. <laughs> Only one fast, Day of Atonement. Many feasts, like the Feast of Purim, Feast of Dedication, many feasts. And remember, a feast is for love and laughter, for fullness and for fellowship. God's inviting to something wonderful, something great, something good, something that'll make us sing, something that'll take away our fears. Something that will permit us to accept ourselves despite what we know about ourselves. So he says the kingdom of heaven is like a king who made a great banquet, sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet, tell them to come, but they refused to come. Well, the Jews refused. After the cross, there's a second lot of messengers go out. Book of Acts. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell them who have been invited. I prepared my dinner, my oxen fattened, last been butchered. Everything's ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. And then you've got a strange verse. The rest seized his servants stone them and kill them. Now you don't usually do that when you can't make it to a marriage. <laughs> so this is more than an ordinary marriage. This is a union with God. Not just a man and a wife. And so there's invitation through the 15 centuries that Israel existed. After the cross Apostles go out, the whole book of Acts is about that. But Acts is full of rejection until Paul says, All right, you reject the kingdom of God, we will go to the Gentiles. And Paul ends up in Rome in prison. God gave him occasionally holidays in prison so he could write his letters. But finally, both he and Peter are killed in the city of Rome. Well, the story continues. 
they paid no attention went off. That is typical. You all have neighbours. I'll warrant that most of your neighbours are not Christians. And I will foretell that in a very brief time you will be despised because you're a Christian. The world has already rejected the two positive commandments of the dead. The fourth and the fifth. They're the springs from which all the other commandments come. The fourth and fifth commandments go back to creation using the symbolism of Genesis 2 you have the basis for the fourth commandment and then in Genesis 3 as well as the last part of 2 marriage which is the basis of the family commandment so there are two central commandments that are positive the rest are all negative they wouldn't be written that way but for my sinful nature because on these two commandments love hang all the law and the prophets first table of law love to God Second thing, the law loved to man. But Jesus said about the whole Bible, on these two commandments, love to God and neighbour, and all the law and the prophets. But in the Ten Commandments, where duty is specified, the world's already knocked out the centre ones. Very few Christians take the Fourth Commandment seriously. And the family's been gotten rid of too. The family will be dead in a matter of time, mm. except for outlets where there are Christians. So the story goes on after saying that most paid no attention. The king was outraged. He sent his army and he drove those murderers out and burned their city. That's AD 70, talking about the destruction of Jerusalem. When Jerusalem was destroyed, over a million people died. They mainly killed themselves, not just the Romans did it. They had groups inside the city and they were fighting each other to rule in the city. After the destruction of the city, for miles, there were graves. All the signs of death for many miles around Jerusalem after 70 AD. Then he said to his servants, the wedding banquet's ready. Those I invited are not, do not deserve to come. Go to the street corners. Invite to the banquet anyone you find. So he's inviting the cripples, the blind, the lame, the poor, and soon the wedding is furnished with guests. The lame people jostle each other with their crutches. The blind, with avaricious delight, are going towards the abundant tables. That section by section the lepers come. Vagrants with mouldy breath. A strange banquet. The despised, the poor, the sick. They accept the welcome. But I want you to notice how the story finishes. There's a strange bit here. When the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? In those days, many kings were wealthy enough that if they had a festival, they could provide a garment. And this is assuming that there was a wedding garment for any guest who would accept it. And of course, this is the same as the best robe. It's the righteousness of Christ, both imputed and imparted. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Never forget that verse. And holiness is holiness. W-H-O-L-E, any double S. Without holiness, no man will see the Lord. But holiness is spontaneous if our heart is broken by the love of God. So this wedding garment represents righteousness. First imputed, cover me in all my filth all my sinfulness, all my guilt. But with that gift always comes the Holy Spirit who teaches me to love truth and goodness and kindness and so on. So he finds this man who doesn't have a wedding garment. He's very kind to him. He says, friend, he's giving him an, 
opportunity to make an excuse, but the man is speechless. And the king says, bind him hand and foot, throw him out into outer darkness, he'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What's that mean? What a strange way to end a story about a feast. It means this. Being a Christian is not a cheap thing. Getting in is very cheap. Getting in is very cheap. I will. I do believe. I accept. Without one plea. Just as I am. O Lamb of God, I come. Very cheap to come. But if you're going to stay with Christ, it will cost you something. You're asked to lay up treasure in heaven. You can't be greedy and be a Christian. You're asked to love your enemies. You cannot have hate to any person in the world and be a Christian. It costs something to be a Christian. But we mustn't tie ourselves up with this last section. It's better to think of a king who has a wonderful feast of love and laughter, fullness and fellowship, and however weak you are, you're invited. However lame you are, however blind you are, you are invited. God so loved the world. Whosoever. That verse, word occurs over and over in the New Testament. Whosoever will may come. But I'm weak, Lord. I make many mistakes, but if I come, you'll give me strength. Let's pray. Thank you for these stories. Help us to apply them to our own lives, that we may rejoice in the gift of imputed righteousness, rejoice in the bestowal of the Holy Spirit to change our habits and ways, rejoice in the fact that we have the verdict of the last judgment, even now, today. Rejoice in the gift of eternal life, which is ours the moment we believe, provided we keep our view on Jesus. Teach us the gospel and help us to live by it every day in every way. Amen. You know, I was going to mention to you if I got there, but I didn't get there. When I was 10, I picked up a little copy of Steps to Christ. And about the second page, it talks about the love of God. And at 10, my heart was touched by that. And a bit further on, which I read later, not, not when I was 10, but much older, he said that Jesus wants us to come to him just as we are, with all our infirmities. This lady was not infallible. She made mistakes. She was not always right in what she said, but she loved God. And in this book, she's very good on the gospel. He says, because of the fall, none of us can perfectly keep the law of God. Hey, I'm glad to read that. I'm not quite so discouraged with myself. She says in this book, because of the fall, none of us can fully keep the law of God. But then she goes on to say, but we're accepted as though we did when we believe in Christ. Well, that's a PS. Thank you.